Hello, I'm Iris Mahan, and I have the illustrious pleasure of being one of the editors of this book. I'm not going to spend very much time. Thank you. I don't want to spend very much time because I'm not what you came here to see. Uh, you came here to see some of the absolutely amazing poets who came out uh, for this anthology um, in the wake of the election uh, in sort of scrambling to understand what was going on and what to do. Um, this was something that we conceived of as being a very small project. We were hoping we were going to reach out to our favorite poets uh, and hand bind some sort of anthology chapbook uh, at a kitchen table uh, and that any proceeds we might get off of Facebook we would donate to Planned Parenthood and the Center for Reproductive Rights. Um, it has since grown into something we absolutely could have never imagined. As first-time editors, um, we just continue to be stunned that this is a book that we're even a part of. Um, the people that have come out to contribute their poetry, their generosity of spirit, um, has been incredibly profound and humbling for us. Um, and, 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 and OR really ha having the sort of, um, you know, they championed this book. Um, so it's with great thanks to John Oaks at OR and our intro Rapid editor Emma Ingrisanti, who put this together, her tireless efforts as well. Um, and so just really quickly, I will just say um, that what we really hoped this anthology would be and really did become was part love letter, part manifesto, part confession, and part wish. Um, so I'll start you off with that. Tonight's first reader is going to be Rosebud Benioni. Uh, then we will move on to Dorothea Alasky. Uh, we will have Maureen McLean, we will have Denise Froman, and then we also have Mahogany Brown. So without further ado, let's bring on Rosebud. Can I be honest with you? I thought this stand was going to be too tall for me, and I wasn't, I was just really uh, scared, but it's actually not, so I don't know why I just said that. So I'm actually not going to read the piece in my, um, in, I mean, in the anthology. I'm actually going to read an essay I wrote um, in the span of like two days. That was originally 10 pages long. Don't worry, it's not. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a love letter. Well, it is 100% love letter to the readers tonight. Um, and it goes up tomorrow on the Kenyon Review, Review blog. I, I write weekly essays for the Kenyon Review. And it links the words of my fellow poets tonight. So if you go to the blog tomorrow and click on the essay, you can actually click the words that I'm quoting, and you can go to their individual poems. So this really is to everybody in the room as well. Poeta, you resist. You resist by creating your own work, and you resist by sharing the work of others. You resist simply by showing up under two suns if you wish, Days so short it seems the earth is zooming under its long-sought anonymous abyss. That's Maureen McLean and her poem entitled Poem. And so, there are two suns in bomb cyclone on bold day in an urban maze of scaffolds forever falling, a city that, resi that resists the little collectibles, polished, faceless, and sold easily. A city like you that resists the little commemorative plaques of tradition. This is a living sanctuary city, and you resist those who prefer the empty facades of old world charm, those who persist the desire for flatlined bulldozed speech that sounds nothing like you, poeta, who often collides with this very city which resists everyone and everything and even you too. And sometimes you wear your headphones in which no song plays because while they say be careful on those streets, you keep them in, still you resist. Because even with sound off, you sing the lyrics as you wish them to be. My mom holds her accent like a shotgun. That's Denise Froman in her poem, Accents. On the border, my mama taught me that nothing exists but resistance. She showed me how her name, Esperanza, which means hope, is a form of resistance. When on my bat mitzvah, she sat on the pulpit and refused to take the name Esther. When the rabbi refused and called her Esther anyway, when she interrupted him and said in a voice loud enough her name, a voice of resistance in a sanctuary in which she rarely found sanctuary with the people in it. When she said her name, Esperanza, my mother, a convert to Judaism, resisted only with her name. 
When my Mexican family filled the benches, my Catholic uncles donned kippahs when my Jewish father introduced them to fellow worshipers on the Oneg Shabbat. These men are my brothers. This was all my mother showing me how to resist racism, intolerance, unkindness. But her, her kind of hope is rarely a kindness. The death of a new day is never kind. That's Mahogany L. Braun in her poem, Marigold. Many years later, that rabbi will read your work on Jewish mysticism, your thoughts on the Minhat Yehuda, and he will tell you, Poeta, that a woman and someone like you has no business handling such sacred text. Poeta, you resist with your no business. You resist this man from your past who's stuck in a past that's an incomplete text, broken record with his broken records. Even in your dreams you resist. In a dream you once defeated a demon and entirely in Hebrew, it's your language. You and a horse that you knew for less than a week in Iceland resisted and you defeated a demon. This became a poem. This became a prayer for others to resist demons. You mean it as a prayer for others to resist demons when their lives collapse into themselves and they think they do not have the words anymore. You know this well when you need to leave, when you're done, when this, this last time, and yet you still resist. In stasis, your resistance as poeta is in motion, in doubt, when all you can do is question why the world wants to name you and why it wants you to be one thing easily locatable in some topographic misery. To be the name uttered, but not to have the burden to be. That's Dorothea Lasky in her poem, To Be the Thing. Poeta, you resisted when you had nothing to show when your life fit into a tumble-down suitcase which opened spontaneously, coming off the conveyor belt at JFK, spilling out the contents of your failures to make a life in Jerusalem, a life that resisted you as much as you resisted what borders and politics it dictate. You resisted when hordes of people stared at you as you gathered your things, stepping over you, sighing at the space you didn't even mean to take. You resist by remembering this moment, not forgetting. You aren't one to take deep breaths, count to five, recite a mantra you once believe. No, you show up for that moment. And remember, this is what your mother meant when she never said outright but lived it. You resist with a kind of hope that is rarely a kindness. And you resist by creating endless suns for a world you'd give your life for, a world of poetas, poetry. This, you believe, the furthest language has ever gone. This life is resistance. It is the most you'll ever receive, and it is the most you'll ever give. Thank you. Um, it's such an honor to be here tonight um, celebrating this beautiful anthology. And I'm going to read, I'm going to attempt to read the poem that's in um, the anthology. And it's a long and several parts, so if I don't finish, then it'll give you reason to get it. So, um, And it's called The Secret Life of Mary Crow. And it starts with a quotation by the poet Mary Crow. And it says, oh, why the odor of decay sets the body trembling? We pretend we don't like sensitivity of the anus, smell of armpits. After cooking, taking out the garbage, penis moving among guts, membranes, juices, gills of the vagina, opening, closing. I am happy to say my dreams of the ancient worlds have returned. When I went there with my cat mask on, music for the sake of music, snow that was not real, water that is not, the bees, the secret life, and secret promises we make to the dead before we move our way over. I move the lantern, the desk, the freight train, magic for the sake of it. I made the water black and gold for you to swim in it, my love. But you were still a child, not real but released into another's arms, almost for an eternity. The secret life of Mary Crow is one where we are no longer us but the beginning of things forever. 
I didn't go to the land of glittering lights and cold mornings to protect you, my baby Mary Crow, who sits in my stomach, fluttering its heartbeat like a wild boar. In the jungle of a bridge, the lights flashing, before all the teenagers succumb to wounds inflicted by the family. Mary Crow, you've seen it all, and all the nostalgia of my youth, my life did not prepare me for the next level over. The night came and went before I was supposed to go. We all have leaves. We are all under that milk sleep at six o'clock in the morning. We all take a risk for love. Mary Crow, I'd never risk you for the empty shuttle of my great grandmother. I'd never risk your heartbeat for the lonely flight of another halfway hello to everyone. I am looking for the real thing. Now I watch and watch under the red bridge and I find the princess who was once you and isn't anymore. I understandably take my steed to the corner road and knock upon the house of my bride and say, Mary Crow, I am here. Won't you let me in? Maybe it's all fabricated. Maybe it's all a farce. The woman in the window is not Mary. We name her Susan or Sibilance. We name her Anne. We got her a good stocking before we shoved the light out. I can't write anymore. I don't speak. The once twice beloved he writes me mantras to himself, but not full of blood. They are the fat sentences of his youth. They are the empty periods that cut everything in two. They are everything I have always given up to be another person. They are green daddy. They are the poem after the person. I can still he hear him reading in the dark after they turn the lights out. When a person dies, they usually find the body on the floor. It's true, all things fall as low as they can go. I know I too have gone thud in the last bit, not from carnal knowledge, but from my love of you, which is vast and unknowing, beyond book and crypt keeper, which is beyond light. I know the striped clock. The ghost clowns keep before the dull chill, right before they take your teeth out and rock your corpse upside down to see the teeth fall. I know the body is a corpse and text, but is also a possibility. I know all the things they said. I really listened despite it all. In the early days, my friend, thinking of the embryo, put a baby elephant in a sack and sent a picture of it to me, the moon dream. Then a cheetah and a lion. He put a tiny baby in a balloon. I took my skin and packed it around me and ate a tonic full of vegetables for health to fill my veins with vitamins. You have to stay, you say, and you stop up my blood with an unhealthy cork. And this, you say, this is natural. Before you put to bed our dreams and hopes and what they were for anyway. I know in that moment when I reached the uneven hour, I thought of my own blood pulsing and yours papery like a lance, like something that doesn't go anywhere, like my friend's big dick, like the children's playing cards. I thought of tarot, which is a kind of blood, and I don't have friends anymore. I just wait and watch for the underscore to make his match in the sun. The girl's unapologetic for what they've become. become. My own sorry for not doing the job like like I said I would, but what if I had known the dreams that would befall? If only I had known you, Mary Crow, would come into my life so suddenly. Oh, Mary Crow, Mary Crow. And that's not the whole poem, but you can enjoy it in the anthology. Thank you. I want to reiterate thanks to Danielle and to Iris for their incredible solidarity and editorial imagination. And they, boy, did they get up and do stuff. And also their beautiful introduction. So it's an honor to be here reading with these amazing poets and in the presence and sponsorship of Iris and Danny and OR Books. And thank you for coming out on a less horrible night than we thought, but still, thank you. So I'll read two poems, um, shortish, which are in the anthology, and one uh, that's not a poem called Meanwhile. The plum thong's been abandoned so long under the picnic table, I think it's fair to say it's trash unless you're into that kind of recycling. 
The ganja's more open now, not quite legal, not quite not. I have a need for relief, for calm, for the buzz a woman's voice lowly sounding itself in the night air might bring. Are you here for the swim or the scream? I know I'll get both, there's no avoiding. I am almost depressed as a reflective climate scientist. And all the old apocalypses seem peculiarly optimistic, though perhaps that's an optical illusion of my 21st century eyes, which are, as you can see, astigmatic. How do you work and where? Will you leave Brooklyn for Detroit? Do you think America's blacks are fatally bound to the horizon of nation? America's whites? They are having to know now their whiteness. Oh ho, yes, they, we are. Meanwhile, the ferns are still green, prehistoric, maybe post-historic, if history ceded everything to geography, ecology, biology from here on out. Meanwhile, I might swim. I might watch Lars von Trier's Melancholia again and cheer up. I might decide finally to move to the West Coast, near Seattle, say, a town destined to be destroyed very soon, if statistics about the fault are true. A poem called Hide and Roseline, um, taking wing from a poem of Goethe's, uh, a weird, charismatic, freaky poem um, about a sexual politics Eh. <laughs> Hide and Roseline. Sexual idyll sustained by a pill. Your libido, his speedo. Date rape drug, shot, mug. Not she said, he said. None bled, none wed, none dead. And a poem uh, which I wrote some time ago, but is, alas, still resonant, a poem called From the White Men's Psalmody. For white men are low-hanging clouds and the bare pine branches lit against the sky. For white men are everywhere and dangerous except when they choose to be pacific. For white men are recent. For white men have no ancestors, they acknowledge. For white men touch anything but claim they are selective. For white men always tell the truth. For white men am what I am. For white men live in the hutch of the soul and flare up in little hoods. For white men are sad and uncomfortable and would rather be filled with anger and active emotion. For white men are badly brought up. For white men refuse to renounce. For white men hoobla 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 who. For white men are oblivious until they are not and then it's strife or the world. For white men live everywhere, including on Mars. For white men lick each other's nipples secretly. For white men are very advanced, but not enough. For white men are mothers. For white men long for their little island where everyone speaks intelligibly. For white men like to teach, but not to stand and wait. For white men must be fed regularly. For white men are turning vegetarian, but ache for remote meat. For white men play drums and flutes. For white men are followed by little throngs dancing. For white men accept any tribute, especially the insincere. For white men are woeful and hapless. For white men destroy what they touch. For white men will bring us all to the party. For white men are very attached to ideas, which has affected ideas. For ditto sex. For ditto sports. For white men bloom like tulips once a season and violently, not like the tended rose. For white men surface like the exotic cicada once every 17 years. For white men have no sex. For white men, a sonnet. For white men beyond all encompassing. For white men are very historical. For white men are invisible and everywhere and no one can find them when they need to. For white men, like a bad penny. For white men prefer certain syntactical structures to others. For white men leave you to figure. 
For white men are the objects of sentiment. For white men are different and the same. For white men are exploding in the desert and in the jungle flaming orange. For white men throw themselves into so many situations. For white men have boldly gone. For white men have large accounts, notwithstanding their proclivity toward gross expenditure. For white men used to think fairies lived in holes. For white men sit silently like large toads until roused. For white men paint ceilings, lift lofts, break bread. For white men spring to life from the merest ant or sown teeth. For white men are nearly antiquities. For white men are voting with their feet. For white men are the frontier closing in American history. Thank you. Hello. How's everybody doing? I'm very grateful to be here. I want to thank all the poets, all the editors. Can we clap it up one more time for everybody? Amazing. Um, I'll read uh, the two poems in this uh, collection, and I just want to uh, say I'm not going to be cool. I'm going to name the fact that this is my first time reading from a book with my words in it. Some people would just be like, I've done this 100 times. No, this is my first time. So very excited. Uh, this, uh, this first poem, um, you know, I played sports growing up, and I thought that I had um, sort of gotten around some of the pitfalls that girls have, like when we're growing up, um, like some of the scripts that we've inherited as girls and as women. And I always felt like a strong girl. I didn't feel weak. But um, it wasn't until like my adult life that I realized I had been waiting for permission for so long to say what I wanted to say, to live in like the fullness of, of, my, of my own magic and to not feel like I was underneath anybody or underneath anything. And so um, these poems are, are, um, are personal, but, um, but they're also admissions, admissions for me. So big up to poetry and the gift that it gives us to sort of recognize parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed. Um, a woman's place. I heard a woman becomes herself the first time she speaks without permission, then every word out her mouth a riot. Say beautiful and point to the map of your body. Say brave and wear your skin like a gown or a suit. Say hero and cast yourself in the lead role. When a girl pronounces her own name, there is glory. When a woman tells her own story, she lives forever. All the women I know are perennials, marigolds, daffodils, soft things that refuse to die. I don't come from anything tamed or willing. I come from soil flossed with barbed wire, meaning abuela would cuss you out with the same breath she kissed you with. Her blood, a wild river. My mother doesn't rely on instruction manuals or men, nor does she equate the two can fix anything if you get out of her way, says the best technology is her own two hands. But once I dreamed I had no teeth, just a mouth to hold other people's things. If this poem is the only thing that survives me, tell them I grew a new tongue. Tell them I built me a throne. Tell them when we discovered life on another planet, it was a woman. and She built a bridge, not a border got God and named gravity after herself. Okay, next poem. This is so much fun. Books! Okay. Hunger. A woman can go mad without herself, you know. Can call a lover who convinces her there is sweeter fruit than her own name, a lover and never sleep good again. I want to believe I'm a better woman now, that I'm writing poems, that when I say poems, I mean another way to say revenge, that when I say revenge, I mean to re-gift re each shard of God back to its maker, that when I say God, I mean to grow fat off my own honey 
and never go hungry again. Thank you. It is easy to singularly define people by the worst thing that they have ever done. But it becomes more difficult to imagine what we would want the world to do if it were us. Clint Smith. If my mother were ever convicted for her addiction, like my father, I wonder who I would be robbing now. The data from fragile families studies say my kind of survival displays more behavioral problems and early juvenile delinquencies. I say, you right. I rode into the night with the pistol in my gray hoodie, spitting image of my father, his nickname akin to Boom, his red skin the only thing I remember, him towering over me, black hair, red bloodshot eyes, already running, already gone. This was the closest time I've ever come to becoming a woman with a number for a name. It is easier than you think to lose yourself in search of resemblance. And no one prays for their babies. Politicians with expensive silk ties cut taxes, cue the reality TV series, suggest art programs to settle the inmates, then wonder how humans tried to climb the walls and escape of their own skin when the teaching artist is asked to stop bringing in poems that encourage collective behavior. Two. Marathon runs of Wentworth miss the room like smoke clouds, and I know TV is only TV to someone that ain't never been forced to look outside their own heartbreak before. What's a cliff dive to a black man hustled by his own country? He earns 92 cents an hour, and my tuition still ain't free. The woman behind the financial aid counter asks me, what does my father make? I say, furniture for the dorms here. I say, grandfatherless children. I say, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know who he is. Three, I enter the gates of a boy's prison menacing the border of Bristol, England, and wonder if the smell that refuses to leave my jean jacket three days later resembles the air of Pelican Bay. I toss the jacket in the trash, privileged with the ability to push away the dilemma of a nation-induced disorder. I decide this is the scent of apathy, and this is the closest I'll ever come to visiting my father. I want to thank Danielle and Iris for um, believing in this poem. Um, I was scared as shit when I wrote it, and um, nothing more fearful than your poem being in print and haunting you forever. <laughs> if, 27 pe if 2017 was a poem title. One, when they turn bodegas into boutique grocery stores, when they bounce cops up the block like this hipster protection program won't turn back left right into Harlem, Turn back Harlem into Chirac. Turn back bed into Brownsville. Turn Brownsville back into the Bronx. Back into Gaza. Back. You will taste this strange and bitter American history. Where the mom and pop work more hours than the governor. Where the pesticides overflow our sewer systems, float our neighborhoods until food deserts, one way in, one way out. Tell me this gentrification be for my own good. Tell me this housing project keep us warfare ready. Tell me Biggie died for our sins and I'll show you a Brooklyn stoop with the baby's name etched in chalk, a hashtag ghost gone already, a price tag on his sister's face. She's been missing since Sunday. Where chopper lights paint concrete or trail of breadcrumbs, the haunting finds its way back to our homes. One, the electoral college is a lullaby designed to put us back to sleep. One, the ocean is weeping, a oh, righteous rage. She got questions for the living. And what about the sweetheart who would grow to love Tamir Rice, Mike Brown, Corinne Gaines, Akai Gurley? What about their mama singing their name before each breakfast? Or the church praying for the redemption Bibles raised in the air? What about they almost children? How about they daddy smile? What about they name make them so easy to turn to ash? How we ghost in black boys for the toys we gift them? One. On a Monday, a white body told my black body it ain't earned no apology for the bloodshed. For the nights when my skin grows so cold, I know I must be inches from death for each death hand delivered to me this silence, this certain dismissal, this post-racial reality show, this confederate hug, and don't it bloom. Don't it bloom like a mushroom sky. 
What's about the blues? Why I cry like hell? Why it hell like America so long? One, yo, America, what you know about noose ready? What you know about chalk lines and double barrels? What you know about a murder weapon or a loose cigarette or a baby sleeping on a couch? What you know about the flag? The truck that followed me down a lonely road in Georgia. The names that I rolled off my tongue in prayer. Saint Sojourner, Saint Harriet, Saint Rakia, Saint Sandra, bring me home. Or leave me steady, gun aimed and cocked ready, con artist turned 45th resident of the White House, while the 44th president is lifted off the grounds by his shadow with his black wife, she truth slayer all day, she cheekbone slay, while the media aim and shot at a presidential legacy until weed smoke and a concert makes us remember black people ain't never been human here. Ain't we beautiful? Those that survived the purging? Those that spill body splay glorious from a hateful, hateful song. This swing, sweet, sweet, low spiritual ain't never been inclusive. What you know about Larnix and Baton? How you sing him crow in the key of Emmett Till? What fever fussed you awake? Who else got cop anxiety? Call it what it is. Call it post-traumatic slave syndrome. Call it land tax until homelessness. Call it abortion turned sterilization. Ain't no lie. Like the one against our stillborn children, ain't no lie. Like the many that shaped our babies into mute cattle. Prison industrial complex reverberates in the tune of elementary. Fourth graders are their easiest targets. One, a math problem. If one woman got a 7 Mac 11 and two heaters for the Beamer, how many Congress seats will the NRA lose? How many votes will it take for a sexual predator to lift the White House off her feet? One, I am practicing this aim. My tongue a shoestring strafe. My tongue say melt the wires of Guantanamo. Yasin Bey coming home in what we thought it would be. Ain't no solace in Mecca. Even Spike Lee left Brooklyn. Here, a slum low will leave my front steps full of rat piss and Airbnb my neighbor's apartment for half my take home pay. Unhinge the city of Rikers. Bring back the Reapers. Give them the loot and the stoop. Yeah, they good at killing. But so was Jefferson. I mean, Washington. I mean, COINTELPRO. I mean, CIA. I mean, they mimic your grace. I mean, it's 2017 America, a new, new, new year, and your facelift be botched. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, poets. Thank you, publishers. Thank you, friends. We are, since, I mean, we're in awe. And we have been since the beginning of this project as we just felt the community build and grow and bloom. There are no words, but, um, but thank you. Um, we got one of y'all, or any of you, speak to um, the voices that you sp uh, picked who are um, identifying as male, um, and why they're in there. Like, what, like what, how you picked like uh, poems from there, particularly Jericho Brown, who like, I love, but I was interested to see him in here. So, um, I can I can certainly try. Uh, I did not expect to be the A part of a Q and A, <laughs> so I'm um, gonna do my best. Um, it's not something that we um, consciously thought about only that inclusivity for us meant that. And this book being a celebration of women, um, every iteration therein, also meant that there are people who love women that aren't necessarily women. Um, and that had a place in this book. Um, not a huge one, obviously. Uh, it was the time for women to speak, but um, those, those voices were, were necessary, I think. Um, and it was just a matter of, of the poems themselves, I think. I mean, Jericho's was specifically really... Um, it was about, I think, like woman's gaze, what it feels like. So I think we really thought a lot about the poems themselves in, in addition to identity. So when Kwame Dawes essentially tells you like, this poem is the poem for your anthology, you're not really in a position to be like, no, you're, you're wrong, you're wrong. <laughs> oh yeah, no, and that's a really good, I think yeah. that's, 
probably the best example would be Kwame Dawes' poems, because I mean, they are women's voices. I mean, those are persona poems that, um, that, that transcend. You would never have known that a man had written those poems, and, and that's fair, that's valid. So we were so excited when we saw the uh, two-page ad in the Times, I guess, last Monday with Denise, Denise. Froman. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Um, I, I, I didn't see the Oscars, but I understand it was featured, uh, you know. And it was so powerful to, to um, experience that, you know, and see it and in a in a bold way like that and you know so you know it was a little in advance of the um the uh, some other full page ads in the times for uh, women's international day uh so kind of got the jump on things with with your poem and it's just very moving and we we have it and saving it we should have brought it so you could sign it but it was so great to hear you read it and uh, just appreciating it, just expressing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We were really excited that suddenly it was. We, it was our. I mean, of course, it's your poem, but Iris and I very much felt like it was our poem. Like, look, it's our poem. <laughs> Hi, and thank you. I wanted to ask what made you decide what to include in the anthology and what not to include? Like, how did you make those types of decisions? Also a really great question. This was our first anthology, um, so we didn't really know. We didn't really know um, what we were doing, to be quite honest. Um, we knew the poem, the poets that we that we love, that we love to hear from, uh, that we're on, always sort of looking for their work. Um, some of our mentors, Maureen taught a graduate workshop um, that Danny and I were both in. Uh, Jackie Jones Amon is also a mentor, as well as Judith Baumel. Um, and so we were, you know, just I think really just looking for. Um, we originally wanted this to be something that had a sort of touch on the 19th Amendment because it was something that was being so strongly attacked during the election season. Um, and I think quickly realized um, that there's such a difficulty in writing from a place that's white feminism and we really wanted to kind of move away from that. So one of the things we talked about in the intro was that there's two meanings of suffrage, one being the right to vote, which is a kind of newer in, uh, definition that comes about, you know, when the Constitution is being written, um, but that one of the older meanings is um, prayer or invocation on behalf of other. Uh, and so we just really wanted poems that sort of, um, I don't know, gave something kind of different, something that we hadn't experienced before or read or um, something that was resonant but maybe didn't necessarily look like what my experience looks like or Danny's experience looked like or um, you know some of our friends who were instrumental in kind of helping us put this together as well. Um, there were a lot of people we asked for the anthology um, and who weren't able to make it um, for a variety of reasons and we just, um, when the poems started rolling in and the yeses started rolling in, it just kind of became this incredible generosity project, I really have to say. like. Um, you know, somebody gave us a poem and it, it, I don't know, it just fit. We didn't really, there wasn't much we cut is what I would have to say is that if there was a poet we asked, they gave willingly and we included it and we found an order and a, a place for it. And I think that's the reason why it feels, I'm gobsmacked every time I open the book because I forget how just beautiful and varied and wonderful like humanity can be. Um, and I, I think we got really, really lucky um, that that was what the finished sort of final project, I think, was. The, the sort of intersectional part of it and the, the way it cut across um, a lot of different variety of sections of identity um, was really sort of a kind of magical thing that happened to us and not really something we had a lot of control over. It's really the poets. After the success of this, do you think you'd um, 
want to make another one, either um, <laughs> oh, uh, <for laughs> either sure. a sequel or a different collection. It's already or, happening. It's oh, already happening. Okay. Cynthia That's Duyoka cool. came up to me on Friday and said, volume two, 2020. Woo. So, yeah, uh, yes. How could we not? I mean, with these beautiful, very voices, like you said, it doesn't even come close to touching all of these varied experiences, right? So we, we, how could we not? Danny's going to kill me for saying this because I keep bringing this project up like year after year after year, but we really want to do, or I really want to do, a rewrite the Bill of Rights project <laughs> uh, that includes both poets and prose writers. And so uh, any editors in the room looking over in this direction? That's also something we'd, we'd love to see happen. If, if it's not us, maybe it's one of you. I don't know. Maybe we may be reading your re rewritten version of the Bill of Rights. Hi. Uh, thank you all first for your beautiful work. Um, I'd love to hear from any or all of you on sort of what in your view the function of poetry is um, as a form of resistance or as a political tool um, and sort of how, what does it offer that perhaps prose may not or what difference does it serve? Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all are not credible academics here as well. So. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I mean, I, I think obviously poetry is is a powerful tool to ignite and incite. Um, you know, we make laws and organize ourselves around a particular narrative or narratives in this country and in the world, right? Like as humans, and if you have a narrative that deems some lives not worthy or expendable right, like that's dangerous, right? People die, right? People get killed because of that narrative, right? Um, and so I think poetry has, you know, the power to like center marginalized voices, of course, but also like, um, you know, subvert some of those narratives and test some of those narratives and take back some of that power um, and rewrite that narrative, you know? Um, and so in, in terms of sort of how I, I see it fitting now, but it's always been that way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a gift. I feel like I've become a better, a better listener because of it. You know, poetry, you know, the, 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 the man or the person that you pass on the street every day that no one, you know, gives two shits about, like, that no one, that no one notices, poetry says you're worthy of a poem, you know? And to me, that's, that's sort of the, 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 the humanity and the empathy and the, the healing work that I think poetry can um, contribute to. So Denise and I are actually Contamundo fellows together. <laughs> so yeah, and there's um, so I have to say when I joined Contamundo, I really learned like that I was a poet, not a writer. Um, and I write weekly essays for Kenyan. And my editor Kirsten Reach is a lovely woman because she lets me get away with so much. Like sometimes a certain editor who will go on name there, he reads them and he's like, "What is she doing? This isn't prose." Um, and I think if you try to attempt to take an idea that's very dear to you and complex to you and you try to, you know, break it down into what you're really trying to say, th for me, the best way to do that is through poetry. Um, and, you know, lastly, I think, you know, the power of poetry in terms of politics is that, you know, I, I'm mixed. My mom is Mexican and my, my father is is. You know, I, I don't think Jews are erased, but he can—he descends from a long line of ultra-Orthodox Jews, and um, he left his community for her. And I didn't really understand what that meant when uh, when I was younger, like what it means for someone to leave his community for love and to—you know—they've been married for years, and who who I've been, I can only really express that through poetry because my entire life, people are like, be one thing. You know, like I'm also bisexual. I know you're sick of it, but you know, I mean, it, people are like, be one thing, and you know, in terms of identity politics, you know, I, I can't just be one thing, and you know, I, I write about G Dragon and K-pop music, but I also write about the Torah, and people have serious problems with that. Like they get angry at me. They're like, well, what are you, a Jewish scholar, or are you like a K-pop groupie? Both, right? So, yeah. So you know, it allows me to like kind of. <laughs> You don't know my past, but uh, <laughs> you know, and it, it allows me um, to be in conversation with other 
poets, and it allows me to say that, like, yeah, I'm Jewish, but I also support a Palestinian state, which is very hard for, you know, members of my own family to deal with. They think I'm wrong, and they think it's an insult because my grandmother is a Shoah survivor, and they said, you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the state of Israel. But I said, history moves on. Um, I think I've said too much. I'm passing the mic. <laughs> I, I can't talk. All agreed. Um, yeah, so I have a quick question for uh, Denise, actually. I heard your poem uh, debut during the Oscars, right? Um, and you, so you were sort of talking about this idea of permissions and scripts, and you know these scripts that we inherit from our cultures and our heritage and our families, um, and what it's like to sort of remove those scripts from your daily life. Um, so I guess I just wanted to hear, like, what was that process like for you? Um, like sort of getting like getting rid of those scripts that you inherited throughout your life. I mean, I think it's a forever process. You know, I don't think if you're really truly committed to doing your work, it's ever done. Um, for me, it was. Uh, it, it, I mean, anytime you unlearn a thing that you've inherited that you didn't even know was there, and then you didn't even know you were operating from that place. You know, I spent a lot of my life being small, not even peeping it though, because that was normal to me. You know, um, that was comfort. And then, you know, sort of like there's always a moment or, or several moments, right, where something in you breaks open and you recognize this setup, this, this, the way my life is set up right now actually doesn't work for me, you know? And so as much as the, the poem is sort of, it can be perceived, maybe, I don't want to speak for other people, but I think it can be perceived as something maybe not deeply connected to me, is probably one of the more personal things that I've written because I walk through it, you know, I walk through that unlearning, you know, and, and so it, for me, the word permission is, is such a big, um, it's such a heavy, heavy word and one that I feel like a lot of people um, can enter from different places, um, but I encourage everybody, like, you know, the poems are, are sort of places that push me, you know? They put me in check, they sit me down, you know? They make me recognize what I'm talking about, what I'm not talking about, you know? And I feel like uh, poems are invitations and I felt like this was a deep invitation to myself and maybe one I could extend to other people to say, hey, if you feel like you live in, you know, where you're not really, you know, you don't feel like you ha you're giving yourself permission to be great, to be big. Like, that's what I want for everybody. You know, that's what I want for myself. Then, like, you know, what is it that you need to remove or unlearn in order to walk it out, you know, and get to the other side? I mean, I could go, we could be here forever talking about this stuff, you know? <laughs> but uh, those are my sort of initial thoughts. I just want to piggyback off that just real quick. Jackie Jones Lamont, who uh, is what's so instrumental for Danny and I as a mentor, uh, always began a poetry workshop saying, what is this poet or what does this poem give you permission to do? And that was always the place we started. And I think it was incredibly, um, an incredibly great place to start because it, it does, it opens up worlds. I think we have time for one more question. So who? Yeah, I guess I need this one, the others, but all right. How you guys doing? Um, Denise, all I, I mean, I know you're getting a lot of attention, but <laughs> <laughs> um, accents was the first thing I heard from you before I even started to write. I mean, I've followed hip hop forever, but opened up a world for me that I didn't know. So I respect all of you so much for doing these things. Um, but that said, places where you can do these things, places of acceptance, places of allowance, permission, like you guys, you women have spoken on, you know, how, where do we find it? What, what's your, what's your safe space, if you will. Is there a, a common place that we can all find for these types of uh, conversations if, if they don't exist yet already? Make sense? I'm a leader. I can my oh God. <laughs> Poetry books? I don't, I mean, that I'm, is that what you meant when you said spaces or, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm someone that believes there can never be enough poetry in the world. There can never be enough poetry books. There can never be enough poetry on the internet. There can never be enough people speaking poetry, you know, um, wherever you go on the sidewalk or if you go to the forest, there can just never be enough. So I feel like it's about maybe making those spaces if you want to be in one of those spaces, but the first place to go is just going, you know, downstairs and reading all the books and reading reading all the poems on the internet and, and being part of the conversation. I think fellowship is really dope and it helped me a lot. I come from Cave Canem. Uh, Jackie Jones Lamont is the former president and the fellowship that I found there uh, changed the trajectory of my writing. Um, you have Vona, which is voices um, across the cultures. You have Cantamundo, you have Kundiman, you have Bowery Poetry Club, Winter Tangerine has online things, Adirondack Writing Center, and then there's fellowships that allow you to come in by yourself and work with other uh, disciplines of art like the Vermont Studio Center and things like that. So if you look up fellowships where you can just start having conversations with other artists, I think it'll, it'll happen for you organically. I'll just keep it short. And sometimes you have to infiltrate spaces. Like ever since like I started writing about the Minhat Yehuda, which is like a, a text related to the Zohar, I've gotten so many mean emails from Jewish men. And it's always a man. And they're always like, what are you doing? First of all, you're not old enough. Second of all, you're a woman. Third of all, I looked you up. You have a Catholic mother who, you know, I mean, they're just like so angry, you know? So take that infiltrated and like, you know, just go where you're not supposed to. You know, we'll bail you out, don't worry. Well, I can't promise that. <laughs> I don't know if you're talking about venues, but like I'll, you know, you have Bowery, New Yorkian, and then a new one, um, Project X, which is in the Bronx. Um, it's the first poetry slam dedicated to Latino voices, Latinx voices. So um, there's plenty happening in this, in this city, um, amazing folks, you know, creating space. So it exists, you know. Thank you for picking up on it. I did. <laughs> I did. I got you. <laughs> Just echoing what's been said, and maybe also um, that sense of where one finds fellowship, and if there are some pre existing spaces that one can be introduced to, but also people who find each other, and, and often one finds that, you know, two or three people decide every Saturday we're going to get together, and every Saturday we're going to, you know, share something or read something together, and, and part of it is just, just so, so much pressure on, on people for so many different reasons, and to kind of make that a space that one doesn't know what might come of it, but to make it a space in one's life, and that, and it's, uh, so I think that that form of fellowship that might not even be institutionalized is a way to commit to oneself and to others, you know, one might be encountering, you know, whether it's in workshops or on the street or in church or in a library. And I would also say too, um, pinging back to some of the other amazing questions, it always seems to me there are a lot of poetries and there are a lot of activisms and things don't always have to align. And I think this sense too of, uh, I, I, I love you know, the, the comment, um, was it Denise talking about listening and that poems is calls to us too. And I feel, um, think a, a lot of Claudia Rankin's line about publicly listening and, uh, and that seems to me, this is slightly different from your question, but it, it is a form of um, being invited by pre-existing books and being companioned not only by actual live people with us in the same space, but people dead and people just emerging can companion us too and can call to us too. So that's, um, that's why I feel like this book is such a beautiful you know, call and space of discovery for me, you know, even to be you know, housed with these other women and some men. Um, anyway. I don't want to hold hands. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, guys.